I... Right back at you. Hi, I'm Karen Curry. I'm the executive director of the Rudman Institute for Entertainment Industry Studies at Westfall College, and um, I am thrilled to have Mitch Hurwitz with us tonight. I want to make a couple of thank yous to Cal and Lucille Rudman, who fund the Rudman Institute and make these evenings possible. Oh, nice. And to Sibby Murphy Brassler, who is also co-sponsoring tonight's um, event. So thank you so much. It took two sponsors. Two sponsors. Two sponsors to get stuff. me here. And our dean, Alan Sabinson, is with us. Just I'd like to just recognize met. Alan. Nice to see you. Before we get into the conversation, which could go on for hours, this guy is so or amazing. Or it might never start. Or it might never start. You don't know. It could maybe never start. Anything could happen. Mitch Hurwitz, if you don't know, creator of Arrested Development, incredibly funny person, started writing for Golden Girls, was a runner first yes. on Golden Girls, became a writer and producer, created and produced and wrote a couple of other, um, more than a couple, uh, sitcoms, and then Ron Howard came to him with the idea for Arrested Development. The casting is perfect, you wrote it with all those people in mind, not the case, No, right? not at all. Um, I, I wrote it, um, with none of this, I remember with like family members in mind. And we, I couldn't get my brother-in-law for Job. Um, he was too offended by the portrayal. Um, and, uh, and every one of the, I, I actually kind of felt like when you, at that point, there was no guarantee that you'd get it from a pilot to a series. So I kind of felt like, well, this will be the thing that I'm doing for a couple of years. We'll be trying to cast this. I've got three weeks to cast this particular pilot. I know it'll push back because there's no way we're going to find anybody for it. And I was telling you on the walk over here that I was, uh, I saw Jason Bateman's name on the casting sheet the day he came in and I remember thinking, oh, I don't want Jason Bateman in this. I didn't even really know him. It was just kind of a prejudice of, you know, he's done all these sitcoms and, and then he came in and it was great. And every one of them just kind of fell into place. I mean, they're all different stories, but, uh, and then there's a thing that you do when you try to, the networks make you bring in the actors uh, to show them, to have them act out a scene, and that's really nerve-wracking. Uh, and, and I remember the um, person I really wanted for the mother was Jill Clayburgh, who I'd been friends with from doing another show. She was just wonderful, and she'd never auditioned before, and I sort of prevailed upon her, and I said, you just come out, there's nothing to it, they love you at the network, you'll get this part. And I remember, um, she did her audition, and then I turned around in my seat to look back at the head of the network, and he said, no. Okay, so we, and I just like burst into sweat. It was the craziest reaction. Uh, and he just started talking. I said, well, uh, uh, wait a minute. Um, you know, Jill's a, a great actress. He said, Mitch, I said, no. I mean, this is how pilots fall apart. You don't have the, you don't have the mother, you don't have the brother, we didn't have Job yet. No. And I was stunned, and I looked over to David Nevins, who was one of the executive producers on the show, for help. And all he did was he kind of went from my eyes up to my forehead to look at the sweat, and then back down to my eyes. And, it was, it was, and then my phone started ringing, Jill, sell. Ugh, it's awful. Oh but the God. casting director said, well, I've got Jessica Walter is willing to go on tape, and I really didn't know her work. And she also knew about Will Arnett, who I did not know either. She said, and Will Arnett is willing to read for this. And I said, oh, Will's the best. I mean, we've got to get Will. <laughs> Uh, and then Will came in a week later, and I was so delighted at how good he was that I did another incredible, like, rookie mistake, is I walked out of that casting session, and I said, you got it, right? We've been with the network. I said, you got it. He said, that's great. And then I turned, and there was Rain Wilson, ready to read next. <laughs> Come on in. Let's give it a shot, see what happens. Oh, oh did he read? Then. He did, yeah. I, I, I think I, you know, some lame. You got it. You got the words right. <laughs> He's not dyslexic. But Jeffrey Tambor is amazing because he was just a one-off. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah, he was, I had written, I had actually written the Tobias part with him in mind. It was really, and it was Jill Clayburgh who said to me, because she'd read it, she said, boy, this is so sad. If they're all our age, which I think was 60 at the time, uh, for some reason I saw them all as 60-year-olds. Isn't that weird? Yeah, and, and she said, no, you can't cast Jeffrey as Tobias. This is a tragic story. <laughs> Family that can't be saved. Uh, and so Jeffrey was willing to come in and do a day, and 
a lot of them were part-time. Tobias was part-time. Oh. David Cross, I love that scene because we'd been shooting for about four days at that point. And I had called him on the phone and I said, any part you want. I just wanted David Cross in the show. And I really hoped he didn't say Michael. I kind of thought he might say Michael, but I was going to deal with it if he did. And he said, I like Tobias. I thought, that's good, because he's a little outside the family. But I never got to meet with him. I, he came in the night before. The only conversation we had was, can I wear a mustache? I, said, I love where you've taken this. <laughs> you've really brought this guy to life. And that scene, I remember being over in the corner by the cameraman. And we'd been shooting this hyper-realistic show where people were speaking like Jason does. Everything was kind of thrown away. And David Cross walked out. <laughs> How are you? And once again, I burst into sweat, which <laughs> turned out to be my tell <laughs> that I was nervous. And uh, I remember thinking, what is this that he's doing? And it's exactly that performance you see there, that hilarious performance. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. There, there's a funny thing. I heard it an interview. Great. Uh, a reunion thing that you guys did in New yeah. York. And the funny thing about the mustache and the studio and whether they wanted to... We were to shooting. We started shooting him. Um, and it was like 6 a.m. And he was on that other boat for the partiers, you know, the, the protesters. And uh, we got this frantic call from a network executive saying, Gail doesn't like mustaches. <laughs> Gail Berman, who was running the network, she doesn't like mustaches. What? But this is what, it's going to be this kind, she's not going to like this show. I mean, there's a lot more offensive things than mustaches in this thing. <laughs> um, but it was a problem, and what are we going to do, and we got to reshoot. And David and I sort of got in a corner, and David it was equally passionate about the mustache, and he was right. You know, he's like, you should have a mustache. Tobias. <laughs> so, uh, but, he, um, but he said, you want me to just go, like, give it 70%? I said, that's a great idea. So he went out there, and he just did a bad performance without a mustache. And we said, we're just going to shoot it both ways, and we'll let Gail decide. And it was really a risk. That. And he just did this flat performance. She said, yeah, it's, for some reason, it's funnier with the mustache. That, that, isn't that? Yeah, no, I, I saw, They're I geniuses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but so now Michael Sarah, who was a baby, a sort of a 12 or 13-year-old, talk about him. He is not what he appears to be in real life. No, he's got a, um, a sexual addiction. <laughs> and, well, they know. You know this about Michael Sarah. <laughs> no, he's, he's, a, he's a very, I was just, we were just talking about this, so forgive me if you were with us when we were talking about this. But he, um, I had seen him in a pilot, and I just, it, it stuck with me. So I said to the casting director, hey, there's this kid in this pilot. Will you see if you can find him? And then about two weeks later, we're casting, and I just thought to ask again, you know, what's going on? Oh, no, actually, that's not what happened. She came to me about two weeks later, and she said, great news, Michael Sarah likes the script. I said, who's Michael Sarah? <laughs> and she said, that's the kid in the, in the, that you liked in that pilot. I said, we've been waiting for him to like the script. He's 12. <laughs> like, this is a step that this, but that's Michael Sarah. That's confident little Michael Sarah. Like, he wasn't going to just do anything. Jason, too. Like, Jason had a funny reaction to this. I, I, so I really respected that, like, that he had to wait as a 12 year old to see if he would approve the material. And that Jason had a similar thing where once we'd cut it together and I'd showed it to him in kind of that form, he, he said to me afterwards, hey, I'm really surprised this turned out well. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, you did this without thinking it was going to turn out well? And this is a guy who'd done maybe 10 pilots in a row, 10 pilot seasons in a row. So he really was the reason I didn't want to see him. It, like you just kind of thought, oh, Jason Bateman makes a pilot every year. And yet with that hanging over his head, as like, okay, this is the 11th pilot. I can't screw around. I got to get on a hit. He didn't make that choice. He, he thought, I, I said, why did you do it if you didn't think it was going to work? He said, I just liked it. I liked it. That's really courageous. I mean, it's, an, uh, it, it's a lesson in I still make decisions about work opportunities that are based on a lot more than what it is creatively. I mean, you have to, to a certain extent. But I was very impressed that, <laughs> and a little insulted. but. <laughs> Yeah, they, he, he really is the center of it, the, the yeah, show revolves around. Yeah, he's a reactor, and he, um, you know, from the moment he came in the room, he had a little, he, his character was like a little hipper, and I had to make him, this takes place in Orange County, which is south of Los Angeles, and it's a very conservative area, and 
I remember in those early ones, I used to have to go out there. I was making him kind of like me. I said, you got to stand up straight, feel a little uncomfortable. And he's not uncomfortable. You know, he's a very comfortable actor. But he, once he kind of got into that, found that posture, I don't know if there are a lot of acting students here, but sometimes it's those superficial things of wardrobe and haircut and, and uh, posture that really change how you play something. And I, I think it immediately made him still. And it was such a smart choice because everyone bounced around off him. Although I was also telling you that when the first cuts started coming in, I was working on another project, but I came back to, to do all the post. And it just wasn't playing. And it was really discouraging. So I try to finesse the timing on Buster saying, oh yeah, those guys do a pretty good job, or whatever it is, and it just wasn't playing. And somebody pointed out to me, boy, just, you know, uh, accidentally just kind of said, boy, I really want to see Jason's reaction to some of this. I realized, of course, we're not cutting to the straight man. I mean, it's, it's comedy 101, you know, but it just wasn't funny to see all these crazy people and not see somebody going like that. <laughs> Like, I just noticed that when they talked about the sexiest Bluth I've ever seen. <laughs> I'll is, take the compliment. I don't understand it, but I... Is the <clears> shot <throat> in there that you told us no. about on set today? Oh, tell that story. That's well, funny. it was related to that same thing. Of, um, you know, these are fundamental ideas of storytelling, right? Like, that we're telling this story through Michael's point of view. And so it was an egregious error that I didn't cut to him reacting. But it's what happens when you get into a world like this is, and, and you know because you're students of this, you're focusing on so many details. And the real challenge is keeping that macro picture, that storytelling thing. I was on the set of your thing today. And um, there was a great line in the script that had just slowly changed. And I got to be the one that pointed out, hey, the line in the script is funnier. And everybody kind of was like, yeah, right. We lost, you lose sight of it. You just There's too many things to watch. So, I was pretty good about knowing I was telling Michael's story and how that was going to work. And then when, I, when it came time to cutting it together, um, we realized we don't have a single shot of Michael in a sequence that's about to happen where the SEC descends on this family. So Lucille's been made the president. We come back around to the scene. The SEC is coming. He's been involved in shady a accounting practices. All the little B stories are paying off. Buster, who doesn't know anything about cartography, is trying to get them out. George Michael <laughs> is going to now kiss his, uh, has just kissed his cousin, but he thinks the sirens are for him. Every story was paying off. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a single shot of Jason. And it's the climax of the whole first episode. I didn't have a shot of Jason. And I had to buy one from the Entertainment Weekly, or the Entertainment Tonight reporter who was shooting on the set. And it was just a shot of Jason just looking out the window. <laughs> wondering when lunch is or something. But, you know, Ron is saying, and has Michael contemplated his future? You know what um, I also heard? That there was this letter that came to the cast with the first script, sort of the no diva yeah. letter. Talk about that. That's great. Well, they, they were very um, cowed by the idea of how much production was in this show. And we were one of the first shows that used HD video cameras. And that was the initial con conceit of it. Ron Howard had come to me and said, I want to do a show that uses those kind of cameras and is kind of documentary style. And his thinking was the production would be so much quicker that we could spend four days rehearsing everything and getting the jokes really solid. And then we just shoot it on the fifth day. And I was, of course, thinking like, oh, well, we're just going to shoot everything we can. We'll just pack this thing full of production and kind of make it The Simpsons, really, like go a lot of places. Um, so uh, that's the long way of saying that, oh, oh the letter. yeah, so, so uh, we, I remember we had this production meeting and they said, how are you going to do this? How are you going to have boat chases and this kind of thing? And you, you've got one of the characters going to a birthday party and I, the director, Joe Russo, Joe and Anthony have now gone on to do a lot of great stuff, said, uh, well, we're just going to go around, we'll just go grab a birthday party. And I remember the producer saying, you can't just grab a birthday party. You're not going to, you can't just stumble into someone's house and shoot their birthday party. But, so they were very anxious about this whole production. And as a result, we sent out a letter saying, we're doing this on the cheap. Um, you're not going to have your own uh, giant trailer and that kind of thing. And if you're not game for this, don't audition. Which, in retrospect, is kind of an abuse of actors. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know that I would do it today. Really? I think I might say to them, I'd like to be more ambitious than our budget allows us for, you know, would you play with us? But I don't think I would 
be part of the chipping away mm -hmm. of, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, because they could say, well, did you take less money to do it? Right, you right. Know? So, well, did, no. Yeah, <laughs> I did, of course I did. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the things, again, about Michael Cera, there is a very funny story about a scene where they're all piling into a car. Yes. I think we can tell that. It's a little dirty, but not. <clears throat> I think we're grown well, up. Well, spoiler alert, this has the word erection in it. So, I think we're good. <clears throat> we but worse, I had to say it to a 13-year-old. And <laughs> that's really where you get into a gray area. Uh, and it just gets just such an insight into him because he plays such a self-conscious guy and he did that so effortlessly and he's not that way at all and he certainly wasn't as a 13 year old um, and we did that scene a couple of times they, everybody get in the car and, and we were just showing this little piece to say how uncomfortable he was you know going through his sexual awakening with his cousin there and so the, they're in the back seat and it's like well there's not um, David Cross says, boy, we're ass to ankles back here. <laughs> As if that's an expression. And <laughs> just little hints of where you're. <clears throat> um, and so it was like, George Michael, will you jump onto, or no, uh, maybe will you jump onto your cousin's lap? And then the camera's going to zoom in on him. But every time I zoomed in on him, he was just fine, you know, <laughs> smiling. And so I had to say to him, like, okay, um, so there's a joke here that, I kind of feel like we, <clears throat> how do I, so when his cousin's on his, uh, his lap, <clears throat> there's a, uh, like an, an arousal, that, there's an arousal that takes, that's very good, of course, oh, thank you very much, excellent, thank you, I'll do it. <laughs> that's so wild. And I'm red-faced so and, you know, amazing. got it. <laughs> now, the other Would you like to see the erection? No, 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 no. <laughs> won't be necessary, but thank you for being so great about it. The, the use of Ron Howard as the narrator is, yeah. is brilliant. How did that... That was a... Um, what was his rate? There were two big <laughs> manipulations I did in, in the making of this pilot because so much of what you're trying to do is sell this thing, too. And a lot of pilots are made, but it's tough to get something on the air. And the two ideas that I had to that end, one was I knew that when they tested these things, one of the questions they asked was, would you like to see another one? So that's why I put in the, on the next, Arrested Development, which was just a bogus, I mean, it's a pilot. How could there be a next Arrested <laughs> Development, right? <laughs> on the next one, he gets to see her in the shower. I mean, I think that was literally one of them. That, and George Sr. loves prison, so that was really good. Like, our numbers were off the chart. People did not like it, eh, confusing, couldn't follow it. Would you like to see another one? Oh, definitely. <laughs> She's in the shower, right? And, he... <laughs> and the other thing was that they were starstruck about Ron Howard at Fox. And I'd, I'd been in an experience before, I mean, you kind of need a heavy hitter. You need the gorilla, right? And um, I didn't have one on that cast. I'd done Ellen DeGeneres' show, and I was kind of determined, like, I don't want to do this again, where somebody's calling all the shots. And, uh, but, so I kind of got Ron as that, that, what is the phrase, 10,000? An ape can't be 10,000 pounds. What is the? <laughs> 8,000 pounds? They're 8,000 pounds. <laughs> well, I think there's some competitive, right, okay. I say, some competitive work to be done in the field of uh, metaphor. But anyway, um, so, and I went in to pitch the show with Ron Howard, and they were so happy to see him, and they were, you know, they were giddy. They were like, oh, we've watched you since you were Opie. And I had at that moment, like, I, we've got our narrator. <laughs> like, Ron's in the show. I don't know if you know that. He's going to be the answer. But it did kind of say to them, this is Ron's show. This is Ron's show, um, which was really important. And it was great. Yeah, no, it, and, he's, and it turns out he's this perfect counterpoint to their lunacy, mm -hmm. his kind of calm Americana thing that he's been doing forever. You know. So, so Jeffrey Gee, Tambor, again, you hired, in, in, again, this New Yorker festival interview that I saw that was amazing. You guys should have gone to that. Oh, I know. That was the one. That was really the one. <laughs> so he, the very first scene, the very first monologue is Jeffrey Tambor. Yes, that's right. Who was right. supposed to just be a day guy and then gone. Yeah. And you were talking about how that completely set the tone That's for right. The show. I, what was interesting about it is we, he's such a pro, and he was coming off of Larry Sanders. I don't know if you guys were fans of that or if you've discovered it yet. It, it was a revelation. I mean, it was... <laughs> That my wife and I used to re, we were taping him and we just rewind and just watch his parts. I don't know how he did some of that stuff. Um, so it was a big deal to get him. I mean, in the comedy community, that was a big deal. And, uh, and starting with his 
he's also uh, a real artist, and he likes to take risks, and he likes to play characters that are unlikable. And there's that unbelievable scene in Larry Sanders where he gets fired, and the cue card guy sits next to him, and he says, I know we've had di our differences, but if there's anything I can do for you. And he says, yeah, would you do me a favor? Would you suck my dick? <laughs> and I remember seeing that, like, what are you doing? No actor in their right mind would go for this level of unlikability, right? But it's just like he, it's bold, bold guy. And so something about having him in the first scene, not done intentionally, but like if I were to now do another show and had one pro and a lot of novices, that's a smart move, you know? Because everybody, also, he was on the set, so everybody wanted to rise to his level. And yeah, it was. Right. And, but they all play it, it's a, they're all playing it straight. They are all, their characters are they're, all. They're playing, um, you know, they're making a very advanced, like everybody got hip to this idea of don't be funny. You know, it's a very subtle thing. But you'll see a lot of dr drama actors will come over and they'll, oh, I love doing comedy. And they make everything a little over the top. And if anything, I mean, you can't say blanket statements about comedy, but often, um, it has to be taken much more seriously by the characters than drama. You know, I mean, that's really what all that stuff is about. You know, d even David Cross saying, I didn't pack for that. <laughs> Worried. Thinking about it. Not trying to get a laugh, you know. <laughs> thinking about what he's going to wear. It's, and it, it became, like, I, sometimes I think there are two styles of comedy that I like to play. And one is really big stakes that aren't taken seriously, and the other is really small stakes that are taken incredibly seriously. <laughs> oh, mother lent you my sweater, did she? Well, mother's in for a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> just like, there's something about that. Just... The show was, was meant to be documentary style, and I think there was the anticipation there might be a lot of improvisation, and these actors could all pull that off, but as it happened... Not really, because I... The, Ambition of the show quickly became about the storytelling. Um, and I had, you know, the, the older I get, the more I, I realize how everything is story. And that on those occasions when I'm just trying to be funny or we're just trying to squeeze an idea in, it just doesn't work if you're not on story. And, and for whatever reason, I started thinking every character should have a storyline in each episode. And that became kind of the hallmark of it. Um, and as a result, there just was no, the shows were 20 minutes long, 20 minutes and 45 seconds long. Wow. So there really was, I, I got rid of so much fat. And occasionally, you know, there would be great um, ad libs and things like that. But typically, I would have to, if they weren't like part of the scene, I couldn't use them because I couldn't even let a phone ring twice. I mean, I would get, I remember the first episode after the pilot. Um, they, it's the one where they burned down the banana stand, if you know the show, and, they, and um, I remember the, the directors came up to me afterwards and said, okay, so we saw the first cut, it's 35 minutes. 35 minutes, so the show's supposed to be 20 minutes, and it's, I just have to cut 15 minutes, right? And they said, so, I mean, I think the fire stuff is gone, I think you lose Lindsay and Tobias, they're fl flown from this episode, you lose this, you lose that. Um, I wouldn't lose, you know, I wouldn't keep any of the Job stuff, maybe have men for a passing, and I was very nervous about this because the script had finally worked and everything came together. And I remember going in and watching the screening, and they're such visual directors that, you know, the scene's going along fine, and then Michael's riding his bike and he hears sirens, and then there's a shot of his face, then there's a shot of a, a fire engine, and then a shot of him riding, and then an up angle, he rides back, and then we follow him on a bike, and then two fire engines pass, and then cut back to him stopping, and he crosses the street. I mean, it was like, you guys have a seven minute sequence of Michael chasing a fire <laughs> engine. And, but it, it helped kind of understand that, right, that's not what this show's gonna be. It's not gonna be, there's no, nobody's gonna knock on a door. It's gonna start, you know, and, and Ron Howard's gonna paste all that stuff together. Um, yeah. And how did doing that uh, for the actors, because talk, you, you talked a bit on the set today about the camera work and yeah. how it was more documentary reality style and the impact that had on the acting. Yeah, it's all, um, the other thing I, I'm always aware of um, when I'm on sets is how much what you're really doing is you, it's just a manipulation. I mean, it's so obvious, but you're really just trying to manipulate and get back to the idea that you had, that little glimmer of an idea 
and try to remember, you know, what it was about that that was funny. And it's almost like all the things in life are trying to sabotage that original idea at first. I mean, you know, once you, if you're trying to create a vision. And I would look at cuts and I would think, why is this not funny? This, this was the funniest line. And what we were talking about today was sometimes early on, the cameramen would anticipate that someone was going to speak. So they would go, so mother would say something and then we'd go over and we'd wait for Jason's line. And it was just such a subtle thing that it said, joke coming, that it didn't work. And, you, and also you bought that, well, this is obviously planned. I mean, it's a really subtle little subconscious thing. But when that camera lagged just a little bit and got there after he was talking, you just felt caught off guard by it. Yeah, there's millions of those little subconscious things. It happens all the time. I'm, doing, I'm recutting the fourth season right now and making them into like 20 episodes that actually go in order um, as opposed to simultaneous episodes, if that makes sense. So I'm telling a whole different story. And I'll, but as a result, I'm looking at all the scenes again, and I'm seeing some real big mistakes. Just, I mean, just things like this, is, this scene is about Buster feeling inadequate, and we never cut back to Buster. Just weird little things like that because you get caught up in whatever that moment is. I mean, you know, because you've been working on sets, I imagine, a lot of you. Yeah, but let's talk about the transition from, so the, the, see, first of all, first season, critical accolades, Emmys, everything's great. It's shocking. And then season well, three. And what became, well, it became really clear that, it, that Rupert Murdoch wasn't a Rupert Murdoch show. Like, he ran Fox, he was the head, he still is, and, and it, I think he always liked the show, but he kind of thought, it's, it's an HBO show, it's not our show. I, by the way, always liked the fact that it was on Fox, mm. even though it wasn't the perfect fit. But I kind of thought, yeah, let's do this for free for people. Because there were great shows, Larry Sanders on HBO, but nobody got to see him. So, um, but it, it kind of, you know, the, the mechanics of the studio system, like I say this in complete fairness to them, the, it's a crazy model where if this show costs $2 million an episode, Right, and so the way it would work, and forgive me if this is just, if you know all this already, but I discovered it through the, you know, this experience, is the network will pay one million of that, and that'll be the license fee, and then the deficit is something the studio pays. Uh, so the studio is basically a bank, and the studio is betting on the fact that if they make 100 of these, in other words, they spend $100 million, they'll be able to sell it for 300 million. The network gets their money back right away with advertising, but the studio doesn't. So, in fairness to the people at Fox, and it's a little more complicated because Rupert Murdoch oversees both the studio, or the bank part of the thing, and the network. Um, it was bad business for them. They were looking at this, it was eight million viewers a week, which is now a huge number, but anybody can say that, you know. Um, and, and he was thinking, how are we going to make back our $100 million? It's never gonna happen. So for them, and now we're into speculation a little bit, but I think it was like, let's let this thing just run its course. We can't just cancel it because it just won Emmys, which we were as shocked as anybody that we got that attention. And, but now we've got a problem on our hands because we've got this critically acclaimed show that people aren't watching and how do we cancel it? And the, and the decision kind of was no um, promotion, like let's not spend money on it. After the second season, they didn't even take an ad out in Emmy magazine. Oh, that God. one was hard because we were the reigning champs. And there's a magazine called Emmy Magazine. And you know, will you please consider, you know, whatever it was on at the, the war at home and the nothing for arrested, which is, you know, that's how the Emmys makes their money basically from those ads. So it was kind of a snubbing there. And then, but we got nominated anyway and we didn't win the second year. And then it was like, okay, we're canceling the show in the third year, except Gail Berman left. They brought in a new president and the new president said, Again, this is largely speculation, but it's kind of informed. I'm not gonna go out there on that stage in New York in front of all those advertisers and say we're canceling Arrested Development. This is a, you know, it's a high-end show and it's an acclaimed show. So I, at that point, we were just, it was like the clock was ticking. They were, they were airing us months apart and they were just waiting until nobody was noticing kind of, and they could kind of kill it. And then I got Charlize Theron to oh, do, yes. who just won an Academy Award and she's hot. You know what I mean? Like, what else <laughs> could they possibly want? And I got her to do five episodes. And, um, 
they didn't promote her once. There wasn't, they, and they, they showed one of her episodes and then four of them against the Olympics, and that was the end of it, basically. Oh the one funny part of it was when he called me, when the guy called me to cancel the show, he said, <laughs> he said listen, it's not gonna work. we gotta end this thing. And I said, I understand, I was, you know, take the high road. Um, and he said, and you know, <clears throat> next week, we're starting the Pamela Anderson show. So I said, I get it. <laughs> I get it, it's gonna be huge. It was called Stacked. I mean, how could that not work? <laughs> it takes place in a bookstore, get it? Sort of past tense of stacks. Well, don't worry about that. She's stacked. And, <laughs> and it, they did horribly. It did, now, they they he, never did as well in that spot again. In that spot? Yeah. Now, if there had been Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and all of that, my sense is that the show would have had a life. I don't know. I mean, I think it, it eventually did. Um, it was, it fundamentally, I fundamentally made a choice to do a show that required the audience's attention. It just, those are the shows I liked. As I said, I would rewind to see the subtleties in Jeffrey Tambor's performances. I loved The Sopranos. I, I just think television does those two things really well. Shows that you can't wait to watch and shows that are just on, that are fine, that are, you're happy to have on. No, I just mean the fan, the fan well, pressure. Well, so I think that, so I think it didn't get a lot of viewers because it felt dense and, but then once, maybe you're right, but once it was like on iTunes and things like that and DVD, once it was on a medium where you had to choose to watch it, and that's the revolution really. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're giving something your attention. You can't read a book out of the corner of your eye, mm -hmm. right? So, so once you, you, people who are actually actively seeking this entertainment, it does very well because it rewards paying attention. But on right. broadcast, maybe it never would have done better. Mm -hmm. I don't Interesting. know. I mean, I watch a lot of shows on broadcast that I don't pay much attention to, uh -huh. and I like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's all different. I could talk to you for five more hours, but I want the um, folks out there to have a chance to ask questions. We have two people with microphones, so if any out. of you have questions, um, one of the mic holders will get to you. I think, and I think we've got someone okay, over I, here. I, maybe you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't really need a microphone. Yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> That's the word on you. <laughs> Um, so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, one of the great things about the show is that it really works well like on a Netflix where you can go back and you can watch and the repeated viewing. Um, particularly in the second season, there's the joke with Buster losing his hand. And yeah. I'm just, you know, that's one of the great things about this show as a comedy, you can go back and you catch those jokes that you might have missed that they're alluded to. So tell me kind of a little bit about that writing process. Like how much planning did you have in terms of, you know, um, putting those things, or even um, Tobias's handprints going around. I mean, you're, 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 you're foreshadowing, uh, you know, through the, yeah. all of the whole season. It was, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I was noticing it in this pilot. Like, wow, I was doing this then. Like the joke that, it can't even be a joke because you don't know what she's talking about when she says, I have that exact same blouse. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of thought that was something I came to later, but I guess not. But um, I think I just, so much of it was a reaction to um, the kind of comedies that I'd been working on where, and the notes. I mean, forever. You know, anytime something was legitimately funny, the writer's room really would just bust up or we just couldn't wait for it, that was always the stuff noted because it was unexpected, it was different, and it just didn't fit the mold of what they're seeing in other shows. Um, and this was one of those things that I just wanted to do. I just thought, I just want there to be things that will pay off later. I, it was an audacious thought, because we weren't even guaranteed that we'd get reruns or be on DVD, um, but there were certain little things that kicked me off on that road. One was that um, I'd seen, uh, Capturing the Freedmans, which is a great documentary. And one of the conceits of that was the father was being, um, you know, kind of, um, what's, it, what's that, I was it ramrodded, but that's gonna be very inappropriate in a second, as you'll see. Um, <laughs> but he was being accused of all sorts of, you know, like child mischief and pederasty and things like that. And he wasn't standing up for himself. He wasn't making a stand. And it turns out it was because he had this other thing he was guilty of and he didn't want to come out. So I loved that idea that we've got a father in prison Maybe he doesn't want to come out of prison because there are worse crimes. So we spent, I mean, this was really capricious, but you know, you get like seven, eight weeks of pre-production time. I spent about five of those weeks just trying to figure out what the series was. And at the end of those five or six weeks, I remember thinking, okay, it's going to be about 
Jimmy Vallely's joke, building homes for Saddam Hussein. <laughs> that was his crime. He was building these lousy model homes in Iraq, and he doesn't want to, they'll kill me, they'll kill me, Michael, they'll kill me. And, um, and then it was like, great, we got episode 26. Now we just got to get one through 25. And, <laughs> and it was, you know, I mean, it's, it's not done a lot because it's, it really, it's like it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time. Um, with like Buster losing his hand, that was something where over the break I had written to the writers and I said, and this is a good trick to do bad examples sometimes, I said, um, while you're thinking of stories, try not to just think of somebody date something, but really think of big crazy ideas like Buster gets his hand bitten off by a seal. Um, bad example. And then I wrote them back afterwards and said, no, it's not a bad example. We're going to have, let's have him, have him <laughs> hand bitten off by a seal. And we just basically knew we had an episode 12 or something at some point. And then it was real, I felt like with that one, I kind of dropped the ball. Like I, I wanted to do more hand stuff. And w Tony was very upset. Tony Hale was very upset when I was excited. I said, you're not going to believe we have for you this year. You're going to have your hand bitten off. <laughs> and he just went, you know, white. And he said, no, I can't. I, I, I use my hands to act. I said, well, you're going to still have your hands. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, um, the wig that uh, George Sr. wore, a Darnell wig, got you to invent Oscar. Right? Oh, yes. Just seeing the wig on what the What did set? you call that kind of wig? Darnell. I don't know that term. made out of Darnell? The oh, do you Anybody know that? Know that? She knows what this term? Yes. Um, yeah, they, uh, they, the way these wigs are, they're like long before they cut them. And so they put it on, we were trying to create the Oscar character, the twin brother. And so I remember going down into the, and I was really busy too, that was the part of the story we didn't tell. So busy, they want to show me the wig, like, oh, come on. Because once you start being the person that needs to approve everything, everyone will let you. And it really is like, once I start saying, hey, can I see that prop, can I see that outfit? Then everybody wants to show it to you because they, well, Mitch is going to change it anyway. So it's a bad, you know, you do have to trust people. But I was at that point, and I remember going down into the, into the trailer, and they just had the long wig uncut on it. Perfect. That's him. That's Oscar. <laughs> Jeffrey said, yeah, this is Oscar, because he's lazy, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Question? Do you want to just yell it out? Oh, yeah, there we are. You've got to Hi. yell into the mic. No. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, first, thank you for being here. Oh, thank and you. I, a while ago, there was some talk about you and Dan Harmon working together. I was wondering yeah. if that was still happening and when we might hear about that. We, I don't, we have not, we want to, and we have this idea that we kind of came up with together. Um, but he's doing another season of his show, and he's doing Rick and Morty, which is hilarious. And, and it's great, and, it, and, and I'm doing this, I just started this little production company at Netflix, so I'm kind of creating some shows, but we're gonna do it. I mean, we're, we, I have no doubt we're gonna do it. I love him, he's so great, he's so great. I think, he's, I think he, he sort of plays the part of an asshole, but he's not, he's a total <laughs> softy and a super brilliant guy. Okay, we'll go to... Oh. Watch the show it originally aired. I actually watched the show it originally aired. And, we, and me and my brother were huge fans. We actually recorded wow. some of the episodes. And nice. We watched them. Um, how did you come up with the idea where the Steve Holt um, thing would be, <laughs> would be a cross for the election episode? That was one of those jokes that Wait, really Wait, which joke? Me you mean out. the across pun or the? The cross pun where he went like this and it turned out that it connected to Anne's story. I don't know. <laughs> but I will say that, that there, a lot of that stuff, it's, thank you. I mean, it's, it, it, I was saying to these guys today, like, chance favors the well-prepared. And that's all. Some of the stuff is just a happy accident. Like, and actually, when I met Ricky Gervais, like, the thing he wanted to know, did you know when you named the character Lucille that a Lucille <laughs> was going to bite off Buster's hand? And there was a lot that we did know, right? Um, and in fact, um, he's sitting on a bench, which they just ripped off on Modern Family. I was so pissed off about it. Because ours was so subtle. But he was sitting on a bench. We didn't point it out or anything. But he's sitting on a, a bench that says Army Surplus Official Supply. And it just says Arm Off, because he's bought, you know, right before he goes in, a little foreshadow. Um, and we were writing the scene where I, I think actually now I'm revising what I said about what I wrote in that email. I think it was a shark. It was, it was a shark, because I knew I wanted to do the Henry Winkler jumps the shark joke. That was the, what I was like setting up. And, um, and we were doing that scene where it was loose shark, loose shark. 
you know what? It'll Lucille. <laughs> Lucille's why he doesn't turn around. It's my, I mean, that was just a fortune, you know. But then we had to like turn ourselves inside out to try to find a way to get Henry to jump over a shark still. And I think it was something like, hey, they found the seal. Oh, it's a shark. Right. That particular joke was also had a layer of, it ha again, a coincidence, but it happened to be the episode where they made us promote Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> so we were jumping the shark. So we ended up having Henry Winkler jump over the shark and say, I'm going to Burger King. <laughs> Just too many meanings. <laughs> Is there a question there? Do you have a favorite character or storyline um, you like the most? I kind of forget them. It's funny, until I'm doing them. Um, I don't know. I don't think I do. I mean, I have moments that stick out to me. Like one that I just remembered recently was when we had the Larry Middleman, who was the, um, the surrogate of George Sr., because George Sr. <laughs> was in prison. And we had a guy, Bob Einstein, who's Albert Brooks's brother, in case you don't know that. And he had, he's got a camera in his hat, he's got an earpiece, and so everything is slightly oh, delayed, you know. Make it seem like I care. Don't say that. <laughs> it's just this great device to never work, you know. Is that with Bob Loblo? <laughs> like the cone of silence and get smart. Like just a funny mm -hmm. idea to have something that just never works. <laughs> and, um, but the great thing about that was when he showed up to the set, he said, now I don't know if they told you about me, but I don't learn lines. <laughs> You don't learn lines. He said, yeah, in the past what I've done is I've had somebody just say, I wear like an earpiece, and they say the line, like the script supervisor says the line to a microphone. I said, well, you're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> you happen to be in luck. The character is wearing an earpiece, having things with it, but you really should let people know. <laughs> There's one funny. time you got away with it. <laughs> uh, I don't know, there are funny things. I mean, a lot of times I... I don't remember them. I don't remember them well because I remember all the anxiety and all the notes and all the, the times it didn't work. And um, there were things like that that I just saw. Like um, for the longest time, the Tobias getting dressed as a pirate wasn't working forever, and I sort of forgot. Like, no, that was funny. Oh was yeah. Funny. I remember in desperation, I di I used this bit <laughs> in the edit because I was like, well, didn't he do something funny as he was putting on? Oh yes, he put it on his nipple. That <laughs> inexplicable. <laughs> from a character point of view, but <laughs> I was desperate for a Somebody laugh. Somebody else have the mic? Oh, there we go. So I'm glad someone brought up Dan Harmon because when I first started watching Community, my, some of my initial feelings were like, this is like a, just a baby child of Arrested Development. Oh. The characters are the same kind of nuances. It, like, they kinda, it's the same thing with the kind of like really dig into the sh show to get to the meat of it. And it went through a lot of the same kind of struggles with networks, with actors, all those different things. The show's been canceled twice or something, yeah. right? Has or, it been canceled twice? Well, once. Once, I know. But somebody yeah. else said it was canceled so, but, twice recently. Yeah, like, did, were you there for Dan Harmon? Like, did, were you No, able... I didn't know him until recently. I, um, I met him when I cast him in season four in a small part. I think he was so delighted that, like, somebody liked him. <laughs> and so he'd had a really hard year. And I said, no, I loved that. I'm on your side on that one. I, you know, I... <laughs> But he, we had very different personal styles. He did tell me, and I was extremely flattered by this, and I could say the same thing to other people, but what he got from Arrested Development was the sense of, oh, this guy is doing what he thinks is funny. Like, he could tell that it just sounded different, good or bad, and he liked it, but the, the salient thing for him was, wow, for some reason this guy is going after, and I brought up Get Smart. I remember as a kid, like there were, when I was a kid, all of these shows that were all the same. They were all kind of what a sitcom was. And then there was Get Smart, which had some guy's sense of humor, Mel Brooks mm -hmm. and Buck Henry, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that at the time. But like, well, why does this one have a voice? And really, it was because somebody had the audacity to say, I'm going to do what I think is funny and fight for that. I mean, you do have to fight. We had a very, he and I have a very different style of fighting. Um, and he's, he's um, fearless and confrontational. And I wouldn't say I'm the opposite, but I do, um, I don't do this on purpose, because I really do try to have respect for the people who are giving notes. But I was once accused of a rope-a-dope, was the style that I was accused of, which was a Muhammad Ali technique in the jungle, uh, the rumble in the jungle, where you just keep taking the punches. And that was kind of my thing. They'd give the note, and I'd say, let me give that some thought. And I meant it. I wasn't just, you know, I really would try to give it some thought. And I really would address it, but I wouldn't address it the way they wanted. 
So they'd say, we don't like this line. We think it makes Michael look mean. So I would kind of take this macro approach and say, well, I don't want Michael to be mean. So I would maybe up some other moment. I'd give him some other pause, or I'd give him some moment where we see he cares. But I'd leave the line, and that really pissed a lot of people off. So we had the same effect, mm -hmm. even though I wouldn't say, that's a stupid note. I'm not doing it. So with Netflix, are there notes? Well, no. Netflix, so far, now I've had this great fortune of becoming friends with the chief um, entertainment officer there, a guy named Ted Sarandos, who is just a comedy lover. And it was very, very different from the start. First of all, he brought back Arrested because he liked Arrested. That was novel. I mean, honestly, I just, the day after we got the Emmy on the first season, I got called to the head of the network's office. And I walked across the lot sort of thinking, OK, be humble. Don't say I told you so. Be, and I got there, and she said, all right, this has to stop now, OK? This show has cost a lot of money. Now we're getting attention. You've got to stop making this arcane thing that nobody gets. And I still had my, my <laughs> humble smile on my face. Like, yes. yes. <laughs> Listen, thank you for all. Like, I couldn't even process <laughs> that I don't get to be false humble now. I have to like be defensive. I said, oh, well, let me work on that. And it, that's what that show was. Again, I get it. It's a lot of money at stake, and it's not about feelings, right? But I think there was the perception that I was doing it to be an artiste. And really, I was being as creative as I could, but I was doing it to make them a lot of money. I mean, that really was. I, just, I was wrong in the short term, anyway, about what I thought would be successful. I mean, this was after Seinfeld. So I kind of thought, like, no, people can handle a lot of jokes and a lot of stories. Um, but anyway, I think I lost the point. Oh, so Netflix. Um, so he came into this, and he would just loved it. And Ted would come to the set, and he'd whisper jokes to me for Tobias. And then I would say the joke. I wouldn't say Ted gave me a joke. I'd go over and tell Tobias, and Tobias would do it and get a laugh. And then I'd say, that was Ted's. So they were good? Yeah. Oh. Well, he's hilarious. By the way, another rookie mistake. You never want to give somebody credit for a joke before, hey, everybody. You know, Karen's got a joke she wants to, you know, it's like, because then it bombs, and then it's, right. you just kind of have to wait. But, um, but his stuff always worked. <laughs> but he was pitching in the characters, you know. And the other big thing was Michael Cera joined the writing staff in the fourth season. And that was, I mean, at first I was kind of doing it, I love him, and it was like, all right, we'll have, it make, maybe make the other writers uncomfortable, but I'll have him there and he'll have this experience. And good for him for wanting to do it. You know, he could go make a giant movie and he's going to want to sit there for $1,000 a week, which is low money for him, you know, and, and pitch, and it's long hours. You sit there for 12 hours. It's very restive experience. And it very quickly got to the point where it's like, where's, what do you mean we're shooting with Michael Sarah today? We need him in the room. He was so funny. Oh. So, and it was almost like, right, it's your first language. You were raised speaking Bluth. <laughs> <laughs> it really, like it formed his comedy. It really... They're all great. They were, I, that, was, that was the real fortune that we just found these people, you know. It's almost all you hope for. Mm -hmm. Were like they the thrilled people. to come back? Yeah, together? they were. I was very circumspect about, you know, occasionally people will say to them, like, wow, so you, Mitch just calls and you run. And I'm like, no, don't say that. Don't. It's their show. Mm -hmm. they're, they're proud of it, too. They should be. It's not, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, obviously, I feel like it's my show, but it's their show, too. So I think that's been fortunate for us. And also, we died young. I mean, there's something. That you mm -hmm. know, nobody goes back and says, you know, wasn't a very good actor. James Dean, go and watch one of his movies again. <laughs> Not that good. You don't. You kind of like died young. He was the best. <laughs> so we were we had the benefit of that. I love it. Question there. So you briefly mentioned that um, you're recutting the fourth season, and you weren't entirely happy with the way that it was originally released. Um, so my question is, what? process kind of led to it breaking the style and being these synchronous episodes, and when can we see the recut? Okay, well, um, so just to correct one little thing, it wasn't that I wasn't happy with how it was released. Um, I just, I'm never, um, first of all, I'm never that happy with my own work. It takes me, I think this is the first time I've not winced watching that podcast. You were enjoying it. I was enjoying it, yeah. and I probably, I probably haven't seen it in six years. And I, so I no longer just, I'm kicking myself for all the little things, you know. Um, and there's a lot of them, you know. And, and of course, nobody else would notice, you know, just like nobody else notices what you don't like about your hair on a certain day, you know. It just it looks like the same person to me. But, you know, you're just so close to it. Um, 
with the, the process for season four was really interesting because I had been trying to make a movie of this show for a long time. When I finally sat down to write the movie, I realized, wow, one of the compelling narratives now, if you care about the show enough to see the movie, is where they've been. I mean, it's, it's impossible to tell a, a story about people that are growing up and you skip six years and not say, here's where he went to college, here's what happened to Job the magician. So I started outlining where they've been and I quickly realized if I give three minutes per character to this, I'm halfway through the movie and nobody's had a conversation yet. So I, I came up with an idea that was, um, it was kind of just exploitative. It was, let me just do these little webisodes um, and I'll make a little money and I'll just do like one character each and it'll just be for fans. And if you see the movie and you didn't see it, it won't matter. And if you've seen it, you just have this instant. So I pitched it to Netflix and they loved it. And then we started doing promotion about it and then it was like Arrested Development is coming back. And I suddenly realized, oh, I have a problem here. Because <laughs> the only reason I had pitched this as webisodes is because I knew I couldn't get the actors. I, I kind of figured I can get every actor for one week, which is the duration of an episode. But there's no way I can get Jason Bateman for three months, right? And um, so, so I, it was, I started going down this road of, all right, maybe there's a way to have them together, embrace the fact that this story, uh, th this family is so much in each other's web, and they're, they're so enmeshed that even when they're apart, th there's connectivity that there's a cause and effect in everything they do, that they're their own worst enemies. And so that I started developing this narrative of, you know, in Maybe's story, if I can just get one scene with George Michael, then I'll set up George Michael so he comes into that with a different attitude. And, and the more press that came out, the more I started realizing, God, you know, I'm trying to preserve a movie which is 90 minutes, and I've got eight hours to fill here. I think I'm doing this backwards. Mm -hmm. So I really started moving a lot of the bigger story pieces, and, and then it kind of evolved into this idea of, it'll be act one of a movie. It'll be all these things start to build up, and all these complications happen, and then everything goes to hell, and that's what happens on page 30 in a movie, right? And then we'll stop and there'll be a movie. The, the knee jerk of the re response to that is like, wow, see, this season four is such a bummer. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I forgot to tell everybody. Yeah, it ends badly. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it ends with complications that are propel, you know, gonna propel. So, but what has been really fun is those were, so we did 15 episodes, all told, and now I'm turning them into 22 episodes, because some of the episodes are 37 minutes, and it's working great. I mean, it's really interesting. It's allowing me to tell the story completely differently, find all these themes that were always in there, but were hidden, which is like, the baptism at sea affects these three people with these three different religious epiphanies, and that'll be one episode. And I you know it's been very cool so far, but we, it took a long time. Uh, a couple of colleagues and I printed out the entire grid of the show onto magnetic paper, and then we cut it up and we started putting it on. It's been really complicated, but I think it'll be cool. I think it, it won't look complicated. It'll just look like the old episodes. And when it comes out, I don't know. I don't know, because I'm doing it a little bit. I'm just doing it for 20th to encourage them to do something with it. So hopefully soon. I'll send you a link. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the writing process for a comedy that's as tight as the rest of development, where like every joke matters. And I think I've listened to a lot of your interviews, and like every time Arrested Development comes up, you talk about Jim Vallely yeah. and how you know you've had a long time collaboration with him. So just you know, talk about that. Yeah, I, so I, I say when I was like probably your age and um, was graduating and I, I went through this period of intense nausea, thinking, you know, I, I don't want to put, uh, put any ideas in your heads, but it was like, what am I going to do with my career? What am I going to do? And I don't know, and I tried spending some time alone writing and that was miserable. What am I going to do? And I, I think it kind of guided me toward television because it's social. And even though I still sometimes prefer writing alone, I learned how to write with others. And that was a really important thing. By the way, I got over that nausea when I said to my father, I finally confessed to my father, I said, you know, I'm nervous all the time. I just I feel like I'm, I don't even want to say this because I don't want to make it real, but I'm just so anxious. I just feel like I could be sick at any moment. And he said, oh, that'll never go away. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? He said, I could vomit right now. <laughs> and it was so funny to me. 
I said, really? He said, oh, God, yeah. He said, you just, you know, a career is an anxiety-producing thing. <laughs> okay, fine, all right. <laughs> and then it went away. It was like, you always How have to like, put the light on something, you know? Anything you're ashamed of, it's like, you got to bring it out of the light. But um, so, so eventually I started working in rooms, and it took me a long time, writer's rooms, once I got on shows, which was not an easy, easy thing to do. But then I went through a, an intense period of self-consciousness where I would be aware, I, I've just gone through the entire act and I haven't pitched anything. Uh, he got in a great joke and I was gonna go down that road and it's self-consciousness. And that went away when I was finally in a position to, to like run a show, to be the person in charge. And suddenly it wasn't about my ego, it was about like, just we gotta get this thing done and I was pitching like crazy. So it, it was like a lesson in getting out of your own way, kind of. Um, with the, the writing process, you know, um, it, I, I always spent a little too long on the stories. Um, and it would be very vexing to the writers, and I, I would say, well, wait, so we've got all these, okay, let's write it, can we write it now? And I'd say, yeah, but I just wish there was some way, we've got Lucille not driving, and we've got Tobias has learned how to drive. There's gotta be a way we can, you know, like, oh, one more thing to tie together. Part of that was writing avoidance, I think. Your style is made of what you can't do sometimes or what you think you can't do. So I would be nervous to sit down and start writing the dialogue, so I would just do one more pass at that outline. That happened to be my sickness. But then the writing itself, I would do very quickly over a period of about three days with writers in the room, maybe three or four writers. Jim Vallely was always one of them. He's a really brilliant guy. And we know each other well. It's like a basketball team or something. And, and I would type, and it would be up on the screen. And, people would yell things out, or I would say, is there a funnier name for the restaurant? Or, wait a minute, why is she even going to this party? You know, and we'd stop and we'd, but I kind of kept control of it that way, so it would all go through my brain to a certain extent. And also I would learn how to listen while thinking. That takes a little while, because you just want to say, shut up, shut up, shut up, I'm just thinking. It's a weird thing, you know, to write with other people around. Um, and then we would write these incredibly bloated scripts. Scripts were supposed to be like 30 pages, would be long for Arrested. And the first drafts would be 55 pages. And everybody would be so tired that I wasn't hurting their feelings to cut their favorite stuff. That was kind of the trick. It'd be one in the morning. I'd say, let's lose this learning how to walk thing. It's not funny. Let's just cut the whole thing. It's a day of shooting. Forget it. Take that out. And just really like hyper focus from one to three in the morning and just tighten up those scripts and then be looking at the blank page for next week and being just as daunted. Because that one worked, it all worked. But I think it's sometimes, it's, um, it's just applying yourself. It's, it's grit, it's just perspiration, it's all those things. It's, it's blasting through your fear of finding out you're not talented. Because that's still there, like, you know, I was talking to somebody had a pilot the other day, and they said, why don't you write it? And I thought, oh, no, no, I, can't. I, don't, I, I, I don't know. You know, it's just, I mean, what if I, what if I, what if it's not funny? You know, and, and of course, you, you know, it's like that has no place in the creative process. I mean, it's there. You have to acknowledge it, but you also have to say, it's, you know, I was just saying to these guys today, like the antidote to me to that self-consciousness sometimes is curiosity. So instead of seizing up and saying, well, wait, I don't know how to write something in the Old West, to kind of say, well, well, what is, yeah, what is my take on that? What would my, what's, what am I curious about? It'd be interesting to see what I did with that, you know? Be interesting to see what you did with that. We know what Seth did with it. I didn't see it. <laughs> Question. Wait, is there somebody from over here who has? No. Okay, we'll go with you. over there. Yeah. Are you are you mostly um, in? The, uh, anybody here want to be an actor? Are there actors in the room? Actors and are uh, writers or people like that are interested in writing? And then like production people or producing? Yeah. So it's pretty. And then probably just people just checking it out. But um, I was trying to get a sense of who's, who wants what, you know. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Hi, Mitch. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you, and I'd probably say that on behalf of everybody here, not just for being here, but for creating this show, because this show, I started watching in 2005 when it was over, and it basically became the, the way I evaluated the taste of my friends and potential romantic partners. <laughs> my husband, is, that's the first thing we bonded over, and it was set, set from there on. Um, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> so many questions. It's, a, but... it's amazing to me because we were doing it in a vacuum. Like yeah. I really, <laughs> I, I said recently to somebody, but it's like putting a note, in a, a funny note in a bottle and like four years later opening up and it's like, hey, they're laughing. <laughs> 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 really. 
uh, I, so many questions, but um, I am absolutely in love with Jessica Walter and everything she does. Um, and I have to commend you because I basically get to keep watching Lucille Bluth on Archer today. Because I know. That was the inspiration for that, for that uh, Archer character. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm most curious to know, in season four, my favorite scene or montage is when Buster thinks Lucille's never coming back. And he has that whole opening in the just apartment that, that yes. looks like a month, but it's like a day. Yeah. Where did that come from? Like who? That came so on um, season four. Troy, a guy named Troy Miller, who did Daily, uh, Mr. Show and just done a lot of stuff, and I co-directed the whole thing because of the DGA was really complicated. Like you'd need to get eight directors standing by to just catch anybody walking across, and it was all going to be intercut. So Troy really was running interference me and I was doing a lot of what I used to do in the writers room on the set um, it was such a rare experience I mean I, I felt like not self-conscious at all and that was one of those things where we just budgeted that day to shoot him on his bed rocking or something and I just said wait let's just do a whole thing let's do a whole thing how long would it take to get a sewing machine and they had people running around <laughs> and then they were like well, guys just one more thing we're just gonna shoot the sewing machine thing and then that's it Let's just do one more thing. Let's, can we get like a dummy's head? And it, we, it was all like really quickly, like almost in real time, we shot all that stuff. And then, and then Tony said, when we were all ready to shoot, it was night, it was dark, and he's going to do the sewing machine. He said, can I be naked? <laughs> yeah. Of course you should be naked. Yes, it's middle of the night. And then, yeah, and that whole thing, there was a lot of that on that, on that fourth season because it was like controlled improv, like it was stuff I would have done in the writer's room. And just getting there and realizing, wait, this is the only time we're gonna have Tony, this is the only day we have him, and it's our only chance to tell the story that he's falling apart. So it really was, I, it was very um, challenging for the crew. I mean, they were into it too, but you, you could see like eyes rolling where it would be, can we do a quick montage? <laughs> and even sitting on the set today, I mean, it's so unprofessional. There was a day I showed up at work and uh, directing, you know, and. What are we shooting today? Who did we end up getting? Well, Jessica fell out at the last minute, so we thought we'd shoot all the rehearsal for the musical and the dance numbers and things like that. Great, okay, so let's line up here. Like, really no plan. I mean, I think it shows sometimes in the show, but there was also a lot of, like, lightning in a bottle because everybody was just going quick and finding it. So, but, you know, you need talented, you need, like, Tony Hale. And you need, you know, we had Maria Bamford and David Cross and that thing, and that was the fortune of it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Thank you for being here. A lot of similarities between here and the first question, or that question, so okay. I'll go quickly. But um, my question was more about the quoting that does happen in shows, and while your show is critically acclaimed, and successful and I'm sure that felt great. I'm a huge fan. I made it a residence hall activity for all my dorm students to watch <laughs> oh, your nice. show. So I, I spread it to the people that Thank I you. know. Awesome. Um, but I really was wondering, like I do wonder, how come college kids find it? Like do they still find it? Will I stumbled upon it on a DVD shelf. I watched it after it was over and just like yeah. have it's we watched seasons one through three over and over again. Yeah. But um, it's the RA network. How is <laughs> um, do you get any other sense of gratification or success when you see your work quoted in later shows? I think other than platform and, um, you know, maybe marketing, there are a lot of similarities between Arrested Development and Archer, not just Jessica Walter's character. Um, Archer, you know, sometimes um, uh, when I get a little arrogant, maybe I feel a little bit like, hey, that's my thing. Not with Archer for some reason. Um, like, I did feel that way a little bit with 30 Rock sometimes. Sometimes they would just take literally things in it. And Will Arnett was in it, and he'd say to me, you're not going to believe what they ripped off this week. Like, <laughs> so I, I, and yet, I was a big fan of 30 Rock. It was a different style. And yet, how much did I rip off from Larry Sanders and The Simpsons and Albert Brooks and Woody Allen and Monty Python? And like, oh, yeah, yeah. A lot. <laughs> so, it's, it, so, I mean, it's, I do feel, as I'm getting older, like I do feel like, wow, that was really, that was really fortunate that I, I got to be in that spot at that time. Um, I see that more now. But, it, but definitely, when the show was canceled and other things would be successful using similar formulas, it was challenging. 
That's a good word, challenging. Yeah, yeah. I saw an interview with um, John Lennon once, who was so, there are great interviews with John Lennon on YouTube, I just recently decided to look. And he was so honest about everything, it's such an a important like, uh, lesson. They asked him, what do you think of Paul McCartney's solo album, his first solo album? And he said, oh, I think it's shit, you know. And, and, <laughs> and he said, and I'm really worried. And they said, why are you worried? And he said, because I know his next one's gonna be great. And then they said, why do you care if his next one's great? Right, which is a really good question. Like the guy's like, you're John Lennon. And he said, uh, I wanna be the only one who's loved. <laughs> like, well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of nails it. That's Aww. like, that's, um, you know, so I mean, it's like, I'd be grateful that somebody <laughs> wanted to copy it. And you know, maybe they didn't. Maybe they came to similar things on their own. Okay, Thanks. one more, okay. Um, so at the end of season three, I guess you knew that uh, that the show was going to be canceled. You started making jokes about like uh, like literally telling the audience, "Tell your friends to watch this show." Yeah, and, uh, it and, was too late to do anything about it. <laughs> and, and stuff like um, like maybe we can go to Showtime or HBO stuff like that. Yeah, that so, was like um, speaking about things that have kind of like grown out of that or grown simultaneously to that. That meta thing, that was like the beginning of meta, and I remember thinking, oh, this is really weird. We're, we're acknowledging it's a TV show, and then sort of it became the thing to do. But um, th that particular one, that was an episode that just didn't work. And it was episode nine of the third season, and I couldn't tie the pieces together. It was like they were having a dinner, and there was a kid who was going to private school. Nothing quite worked. And then I got that call saying, Stacked is coming. And, I remember thinking, like, well, you've certainly helped episode nine because, <laughs> you know, we've got something to be angry about. Anger is a biggie. Like, anger and comedy. In the fourth season, we did this thing where we had the Google car. I needed a, another funny car for Michael. So, like, would it be funny if he's driving the Google car? And then Google said, uh, we do not give you the permission to use our image. It was like, well, thank you for the joke because <laughs> now I'm mad. Do you mean that car that takes a picture of my house? <laughs> I can't show the car? It shows everyone's house, where everybody is, where they live. Hey, man, don't show the car. It's not cool. It's our car. So anyway, but that, and so I, I think about that a lot. Like, and with that particular one, we were mad. Like, we're being canceled. Great. Let's use that as our agenda. And suddenly that episode made sense. It was about all this desperation. We're going to be canceled. So just real quick, was like the, the higher ups, were they like really mad when they saw that joke? Like all those they jokes? did, I don't think they even saw it. Or <laughs> they, I'm telling you, they, I think what happened was they would be at cocktail parties and people would say, hey, I like that show, that Rest of Development. They would have no idea what people were talking about. <laughs> we had five shows to make and we were canceled. And I remember one of the executives at 20th said to me, so what are you going to do now, film? which was really a screw you, right? It was like, because you're not going to do TV. <laughs> you know, so much for the rope-a-dope, right? There's a cost for those things. But, um, but I said, well, you know, we've got to make five more of these. Well, whatever. And uh, each one was hard, you know. Mm -hmm. So those last five or those last four, they just burned off against the Olympics. I don't think they ever saw it. How cool. oh, yeah, that had the 3D sequence in it. The luge. <laughs> Someone will die. And we saw all the cast members' face, and then just one older woman. <laughs> she died. <laughs> well, listen, we, we have a reception afterwards, so everybody hang around, and you'll get to great. say hi to, to Mitch. I want to thank you so, oh, thank so you. much. This, this is so great. You guys are great. Thank you. Nice to talk to you guys. That's great. Yeah, really great. Thank you for including me.